so many lives are being lost due to sepsis. Um, early sepsis is often not recognized. Um, we know this, it often, often, often goes swept under the radar, undetected. Um, many people, they're not catching it, um, whether it's missed in physicians, offices, in emergency rooms, it goes undetected. It's very difficult because there's no one specific symptom of a septic patient. There's no one single diagnostic criteria that tells you this person is septic. It can come in many different forms, many different severity. Um, so it, it's often not recognized, we often miss it. Um, treatment costs hospitals billions, billions. Uh, reals, dollars, whatever per year. I, I think um, if our executive team could understand the financial effect in its other than the you know the most important the patients' lives, I think we would have more support in in really having a stronger program because of it, it's I read somewhere a few days ago that it's the most expensive disease to treat. And I and I can I can imagine with the extended length of stay in the ICUs and, and you know the complex um, organ failure that follows it. Um, many sepsis survivors suffer long-term consequences. So people are surviving sepsis, but long, long-term, you know, rehab, lots and lots of expenses. I just wanted, you know, to really mention again that it's more common um, than heart attacks and kills more people than cancer. I think people often think, you know, stroke, heart attack, those are the only, you know, major killers and stuff, but sepsis is, is, is deadly. It's actually a silent deadly killer that we're just missing often. And the fact that it's such a big deal, I, you know, we need to, I need to know why people are not knowing about sepsis so much. And I'm going to talk about more about that, but we have a lot of healthcare workers. Not only I'm talking about lay people, you know, the general population, I'm talking healthcare workers not that knowledgeable about sepsis. So here's um, King Face of Specialist Hospital Injective, um, our center of excellence. Um, here is just a little overview for those of you that aren't, you know, working in King Face of with us. Um, we're one of the we're one of a general organization with Riyadh King Face of. Um, we're 379 tertiary center. Um, those are just some of our statistics. Um, if you see on the right side you can see all of our accreditations um, we're really really proud of receiving all those accreditations um, and we take pride in the work that we do at King Faisal um, hopefully I hope one of these days um, we could we could stand up here and tell you that we have received the sepsis certification by JCI um, by Joint Commission so that's that's you know for the future um, so a little background, um, our m and committee, mortality review, you know, back I think in the end of 2014 is when it kind of started. They started noticing more and more cases, um, sepsis related, more and more of the mortality cases related to sepsis. And I think that's really one of the turning points that the hospital decided, like, let's do something about it. Um, so they initiated the first, um, sepsis campaign back in 2015 um, and this was basic this is basically our program um, we advertised we need your help in saving lives and continuously thanking people for their support in improving um, the sepsis screening and patient health um, our sepsis campaign we have many highlights but I'm only going to highlight a few for you today um, the first thing we did um, in our campaign was we created a multidisciplinary sepsis task force, um, which consisted of myself and it was led um, by Dr. Diot Noir, he was our leader. Um, it was a pleasure with him leading this group. Um, we had members from pharmacy, we had members from lab, we had nurses on board, we had uh, quality management on board. Uh, it was it was totally multi 
disciplinary, and it has to be, because sepsis is a multidisciplinary effort. You cannot just work in isolation um, with nurses or with just doctors. Um, implementation of our SIRS sepsis alerts and sepsis care order sets in our um, in our ISIS, our integrated uh, clinical information system, our e our e medical record. Um, implementation of the alerts was really, really a big deal um, that we could at least get to that point where we started having that screening, where based on a certain hemodynamic, you know, values or triggers, they would get a pop up to say, you know, pay attention. However. We did emphasize, and I continue to emphasize, that don't rely on alerts and electric alerts. Rely on your clinical judgment um, with the nurses. If, if you know, we emphasize if you receive an alert, first thing you do is you tell the physician, and you know, you go through the steps. But what I tell nurses is, if you feel like something's not right with your patient, speak up. Tell the physician. I don't think something's right, something's not right, my patient I think is deteriorating. Don't wait for something to just pop up on your screen. Um, and then the dissemination of the evidence-based practice guidelines and the bundles, um, which is a work in progress, as you know, and you know, different physicians adapting to the new, you know, it's hard to tell physicians that have been practicing for years and years and years that you know, this is what you need to do when you have a, you know, so it's that whole change, you know, change management, it's, it's really hard. Um, emphasis on timely antibiotic administration, that's, you know, you know self-explanatory. Time is key, as soon as possible. I mean, we say within an hour, but as soon as possible, get it going. Um, we're proud of our emergency room um, because most of our patients septic patients enter through the emergency department. Um, they developed the, their triage screening tool and they actually incorporated it into the ISIS. Um, so that was a big, big achievement. Um, and then, you know, just overall raising, like I said, the awareness and the education on sepsis screening hospital-wide, telling people what is sepsis. It, it came to that basic. Um, what is SIRS? What is sepsis? Um, what do you need to do? You know, just a work in progress. Um, so, you know, the aim, improving sepsis patient outcomes and survival. The key is saving lives. I mean, how could you not be on board? We are here to save lives, each and every single one of us. We have that common goal. Um, and really think multidisciplinary approach. It doesn't work with just nursing trying to run the show or physician to try to run the show you really really need a strong strong partnership and collaboration with everyone even the lab you know get that lactate result asap get you know get the antibiotics out asap with pharmacy this is really really i can't i can't underestimate the importance of multidisciplinary and then there's our campaign logo we kind of adopted another logo, but we added in these little bugs um, in the magnifying glass just to remind you about detection, 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 early detection, and then the hour. Um, so early screening is key. Time to antibiotic is like your door to balloon metric. So just like when you have a patient with an MI and you need to, you know, revascularize that patient, that's how important it is in saving a life with a septic patient to get that antibiotic working as soon as you can. Um, so just, I'm just sharing with you now, I've talked some, about some of this, but just to share with you um, some of the photos and more of what we did to create that awareness. I think with our campaign, the most thing we can say we were successful is just creating an awareness, an educational campaign. Um, I can't really tell you 100% that we're successful in implementing the bundles as well as we would like to and implementing the guidelines as well as we would like to, but I can tell you we were successful in educating people. People are now aware in our organization about sepsis and service and everything. So we had um, some informative, we had some informative sepsis booths. Uh, we stood outside, we, we 
for like three or four days. We talked to everyone that passed by. We went lunch hour. We stopped physicians. We stopped nurses. We stopped everyone. Uh, we went over the quiz. We went over the guidelines. Um, it was really good. We worked in collaboration with our nursing education department and incorporated a sepsis education in our general nursing orientation. So in addition to doing our education on the units, we said let us catch our new hires that come, as you know, we're a multi-diverse um, workforce. We have people from all countries of the world. We said let us catch them right in when they get into general nursing orientation, let's teach them about these um, alerts, let's teach them about sepsis, let's get everybody on board. Um, we did hospital grand rounds, we did nursing grand rounds, and um, there's a picture of Dr. Nawad um, in our hospital grand rounds. Um, as you can see, we got t-shirts, we did a whole marketing campaign, we did the t-shirts, we got people badge holders that says, you know, save lives, sepsis screening, um, we got the bundles on badge cards. We distributed everything. You know, we, we, we tried our best. Um, and we distributed the posters everywhere to the residents, to everyone. Um, and then I told you we had unit-based in-services for nurses and there was actual departmental workshops for physicians, done by the physicians. Oops, sorry, <laughs> I forgot about that. And there's just some of our, you know, our grand rounds our workshops, um, implementation, trying to convince people about the new bundles versus the old bundles and you know the changes and, and all that. Um, in the guidelines, we had these big posters we were fortunate to get. We posted them everywhere in all the units. Um, here's just a screenshot of our triage screening tool that we incorporated in our electronic uh, medical record. Um, and basically, if two or more of the services that were selected, um, the ER physician would have to be notified and activate the census pathway. So get that going. Um, here's one of my dear colleagues, um, one of our nursing QIs, Barbara. She's just showing off her bundles badge card. Um, as you can see, we really marketed everyone. Um, we were all wearing these you know, bundles and just you know marketing, reminding everybody, you know. Cannot over, you know you can never overemphasize um, the importance. And there we are. We became famous. Um, follow us. We were you know we were on Facebook. We were on everywhere. Um, everybody was. You know. um, before I go to this slide, you know, like I said, we are still in pretty much premature phases of really developing a robust program for sepsis, you know, in our hospital. Um, we've got great starts. We've got great initiative. Uh, we've got a great leader, Dr. Noir, um, who's passionate about this field. Um, but it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot of work. Um, it's challenging. We need resources. Um, so we're, we're still in the initial, but um, I was able to extract a little data um, just to just have a brief idea, like, was there actually any kind of improvement with all of this work that we've been doing? And I can proudly say that from 2015 to 2016, um, there was, you know, not a huge decrease, but a 9% decrease in our sepsis mortality. Um, as you can see, I was able to extract based on our ICD, ICD-9, ICD-10 coding. Um, so, Considering the number of cases to the number of deceased, I was able to, to say that there was approximate, we went from 73% to 64%, um, which was a 9% decrease in our mortality, which is a start. Um, like I said, lots of challenges, challenges, challenges. Um, we'll just go one by one and see. So like I said, sepsis definitions and management is still evolving. It's constantly evolving. Like, how can you keep up with it? It's like you tell me QSOFA, and then you tell me sepsis 3, then you tell me SIRS. And it's really, really, really like you have to constantly, constantly have a dedicated person that is constantly up to date with what is the latest sepsis treatment based on evidence. Like, you know, research is always ongoing. Everything's ongoing. So I recommend um, consider putting a formal process in like every six months, a review of the literature, like a formal process. 
not just like a doctor bringing me an article from you know JAMA and saying here you go. We actually need to consider a formal process where we we look at all the literature, we look at all you know in the last six months, and we decide you know what are we going to incorporate. Sepsis is challenging and poorly understood. I can't underestimate. Like I said, there isn't one key feature of sepsis. It's the challenging thing. It just sneaks up on you. It goes undetected. It's always under the radar. And then, oops, you know, we lose a life. And it's like sepsis. Again, you know, if we, if we had detected it earlier, you know, so that's why we're really doing that education on know the symptoms, know the signs, you know. Um, you know, I, I would tell people that, you know, it's, it's like better to be safe than sorry. Like I tell the nurse, you know, you might not have an alert that tells you sepsis or SIRS, but if you feel like something's wrong with your patient, just speak up. Be that patient advocate for your patient. Um, so like I said, need for ongoing educational sessions about sepsis for nurses and physicians. Um, a lot of the times, you know, people think it's just, you know, it's really critical for nurses because they're constantly the closest to the patient and they spend the most time with the patients, so they detect like any changes in status. But physicians all around, they need to be aware um, because sepsis sneaks up, even in like clinics. You know, people get discharged from a clinic and they might be having sepsis. Um, so constant education, I would really emphasize constant education on the residents, our residents that come in and, you know, we really, really need to take a strong look at um, sepsis management. Compliance with our alerts, um, a lot of, like we said, SIRS is so nonspecific, like any kind of inflammation in your body, you're SIRS. So you can't really say, you know, someone's septic because they're having some kind of inflammation. Inflammation, but there's not really a proof of infection. So compliance with the alerts, making sure that people don't disregard the alerts. You know, a lot of the times people say, oh, he's sick, he's a chronic patient, you know, he's chronic, he's, he always has an alert. Even though he might be a chronic patient and stuff, he might be developing a new sepsis. So speak up, you know, take care of that patient. Um, like I said, reinforce it, educate, employ change management strategies. We have to change. Um, last, sorry guys, um, the last one is that data is hard to capture and that we have inconsistency in monitoring data. Um, this is really, really, like you really can't make changes without really having good data. Um, we don't really have like committed person just to monitoring our sepsis data. It's a lot, a lot, a lot of work with the time of antibiotics administration, um, how fast they did the lactic acid, um, the lactic level. You know, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of data that's related to sepsis. Like, you know, we don't even have sepsis performance measures official in our hospital. Um, so, you know, we need to work with our quality management team. Um, we need to start an organized approach to performance management for sepsis. Uh, looking at performance measures like Lendo's compliance, consider the sepsis CMS core measure. Although we're in Saudi Arabia, we don't deal with Medicaid or Medicare, but the CMS core measure has you know, the sepsis uh, performance indicators in them. So maybe we can consider adopting that or something, but we need to do some, some changes. Um, there's a lot of work and commitment, like I said. Uh, keep your executive management engaged. Consider having a sepsis program coordinator um, to oversee and lead the work. Like I said, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of work, and you know you need to have a, de a dedicated person just for sepsis in your organizations. Implementing the guidelines and the bundles, and we really need to formalize in standard operating procedures and actual clinical pathways that are official for the organization and resident training, not just saying we're implementing guidelines, but actually doing it. Collaboration and partnerships, I already said that over and over. Um, looking ahead, hopefully we can do quality data collection for sepsis bundle measures. Hopefully we can develop one day a code sepsis team that if you have a concern with a sepsis patient, you, there's a code team for sepsis. Um, aim for nurse-led sepsis protocols. As we know, the nurses are the key you know, at the bedside with the patient all the time, 24 hours, seven days a week. We need to aim for more nurse initiative into sepsis management. 
creation of a substance program director coordinator, it's a big deal, it's a program. It actually needs a whole coordinator to coordinate the hospital's efforts. Paramedics and ambulance screening, we need to take a look at that to see if our ambulance can start some screening tool to get it really early initiated. And also implementation of an ICU tool, because we're, we're currently don't, we don't currently have one yet. So our, our current alerts don't apply to our ICUs, but we do need something that's ICU specific. So thank you very much. Here's my contact information. I think we are running a little bit late on the most of the number 11 and uh, 12 uh, 40, and we should be back by 1.30 here for the same more. Uh, just a quick comment, and I'll leave the questions at the end of the session, or maybe you guys can grab the speaker. Uh, sorry, we'll, we'll pass by and we'll, we'll leave the questions at the end. Sorry, so we can catch up. Just wanted to just a small clarification, uh, I totally agree with what I said, that we reached a point that we uh, did really uh, have some statistics and showed some improvement in annual response from the ER and also the search, uh, such as early compliance. And when we reached the point that we said we want to do a more sepsis process at least, because we have our, our, our uh, RRT, uh, uh, rapid response team in the hospital, uh, we faced a lot of challenges, mainly you know, conflict of interest between like internal medicine, ICU, and the, the task force because you know they, they were questioning the need for doing an extra team, extra board process, like we already have something in line. So the, the, the last you know uh, consensus on that that we would monitor the RRT, see how much sepsis cases they are encountering, are they able to do some improvement in the outcomes or not? And I'm still waiting for the data from the ICU guys who are responsible for the RRT. Also, a change in the task force to committee to committee to become permanent, I think is crucial. But also, this was left at the higher administration level. They did not yet take that further. Because we have actually task uh, committees for something like pain management committee. You know, so I think that's uh, something that needs to be out there. And this is part of the challenges that everyone is facing. Also, the more specific measures like having the algorithms and bedside screening and having more involvement with the nursing staff and leadership. Because to tell you the truth, uh, one of the one of the comments from the ICU consultant that was on the committee, he said, you know, since every board director said didn't show any improvement, then why uh, why do you want us to develop an algorithm while the day here? Physicians, we take each of our med medicine residents. We have a very robust internal medicine program, and you guys are in ER already. It's a certain base service. So why are you worried about the average? I think everyone knows what to do when we see the sepsis patient. And every month we get a septic patient that died because of mismanagement. The resident was not that up to the mark when she uh, like I had a patient just. Uh, Two weeks ago, or uh, one month ago, before the conference, that the animal was suspected uh, ascending cholangitis, and the patient was left overnight without antibiotics, not because of the ER physician, but the nursing nurse admitted the patient, and the patient arrested in my shift that next day. We resuscitated the patient, and I insisted on going a little bit further. She came back and she survived. But why did we reach this point? Why no antibiotic was given in the beginning? So, you know, it's a lot of challenges, and I would like to thank you all for being uh, with us. Uh, uh, we'll um, go to our next presenter. Uh, okay, well, well, I think everyone is insisting on uh, continuing the discussion. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry for being pushy, but I think this is a, this is a really important uh, uh, opportunity. We congratulate you and your team on excellent, outstanding work. Thank it's you. very hard. Can I actually take you back to your slide with the mortality? Sure. Um, and, and just so, because it sounded, I get the feeling you've got down. It's hard work, but I want you to recognize that you've got 120 patients this year uh, and 9%. So there are, there are 11 people alive this year that wouldn't have survived in 2015. 
that's 11 families who have not lost somebody. So that, that is a start, and that's very important. Every, every human life is valuable. Um, the second thing is uh, sustainable quality improvement is incremental. You're not going to get a big bang, it's little by little, and it takes several years to get to where you want to go. And just a comment from my experiences in terms of change management. The data is crucial because based on good data, and we're not alone, even in the UK, we struggle. 50% of the sex episodes are not being um, captured on ICD uh, in big hospitals in Europe and, and in America. But do your best. The, the key to transformational change and quality of living is transparency. And what I found here, certainly in Cleveland, working for the Ministry of Health at KNSMC, is once you start to capture the data, responsibility and accountability is important. So start to publish sepsis compliance by consultant names. Just put it out there. Just put it out there every month, every quarter, as part of their performance. And once you start doing that, you will see an improvement. Yeah. I've done it with, nice. with OR utilization. It's called the Hawthorne effect. Once you start to put data out there, yeah. people who are not paying attention to you will start to pay attention to you. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I think that's really important. But you've made a wonderful start. Thank you. Don't be disheartened. You've already saved 11 lives this year. Thank you. Well Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. So, uh, right up, you yeah. I wanted to say the same thing. Congratulations. Uh, Thank you. Because what you have achieved so far, despite some still asking what you are right, right, rightly asking for is unique and uh, I'm aware of just one hospital in Germany that far. So just to make clear where, where you are and in terms uh, what you can do better I think is really uh, to talk to the rapid response team because it does not make sense to have two rapid response team, one for sexes because in, it's known from data that sepsis is the most common cause that a rapid response team is asked for. So work together jointly and then you will also overcome uh, this kind uh, of hurdle and yeah, everything else what you ask for, I think it's possible. Awesome. Well, about the rapid response team, the hospitals that do have a currently a rapid response team, I, I agree with Dr. Ryan that you can use the same thing for sepsis, but you need to have a whole sepsis process in, uh, in action, meaning that if the rapid response team is activated for a sepsis case, it needs also to be built in as a notification system or overhead to the uh, X-ray technician, to the rapid technician, to pharmacy. But usually the rapid response team in regular cases, they just come to the website, which includes only anesthesia and ICU and the ICU charge nurse, and they do this side resuscitation, but they do not know what case they have. Maybe a tamponade, maybe a motorex, maybe, you know, a ventricular listening. So that's what we were looking for, and we proposed to have a rapid uh, sepsis support process in addition to that, the small scheme. And uh, this is, uh, as I said, as the Conrad said, actually not this work of sepsis, including the World Sepsis Day and all of those uh, fo focused efforts on sepsis only has been like five, six years uh, globally. And I, I, when we were doing the campaign, I looked at data from Yale or the College of Medicine, their ER, the antibiotic, one hour rate was 38% in 2003. Uh, they improved on that to more than 70 percent after a year or so. So I mean, even leaving hospital in the states, this uh, recent New England Journal of Medicine study about the, the, the mandated measures in New York, which is now starting to be worked uh, I mean, across the board in the states, and just also in 2013. So we are not far behind. I know. I know that we have hit a uh, big stretch. But we need just to put the final touches and make it more tighter and get everyone to agree that we need to have this as a definitive measure and a continuous measure in the hospital. Just about the mortality, I think, you know, ICD diagnosis may not be accurate. I'm, I'm from the group, not 
food. I mean, the statistics we have in the ICU, I think we have a, around the 30 to 40 percent sexual mortality, not 73 percent of the ICU mortality today. I have to find out the actual work. Thank you all. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. I'd like to give you the pleasure of the honor to present the second speaker. The value of the uh, emergency medicine region and uh, with his uh, extensive uh, work and achievement.